Now after looking at the relationship between the signal to noise ratio, the probability of detection, and the probability of false alarm for a steady target in Gaussian noise, and having look, looked at how that, how that looks and that calculation, I want to go over with you for a couple of minutes the big picture of how detection theory calculations are done from the very beginning and how they're broken down and all the different factors and methodologies that you can use in performing the detection process. Okay, So the detection process can be broken down into two areas. First, are we detecting a single pulse or multiple pulses? And uh, earlier we looked at a single pulse that was non-fluctuating, a single pulse that was transmitted, and the target was non-fluctuating. It was a steady target. And But you can also have the target fluctuating, and so that has to be taken into account. And then we could have multiple pulses that we're going to deal with, and we can deal with them by adding them up non-coherently or coherently. Now I'm going to be using words which I haven't explained in this one view graph and this is so to speak the table of contents for what we'll be going to be doing, we'll be doing in the rest of the lecture. But I want you to see as we do the pieces how they'll fit into this funnel diagram so to speak of the different detection processes. Now, we can detect them using both phase and amplitude, coherently, or non-coherently, where we take the magnitude of the return from each pulse and add it up. And we can be dealing with the targets that fluctuate or do not fluctuate. Now, we can then go into a, a different, uh, uh, either a square law detector or a linear detector, the linear detector would mean we're dealing coming out of this port here with the voltage and the square law detector would be with the power. Uh, in the past, and that's many decades ago, the, the people used a logarithmic detector because some backgrounds fluctuated log normally. Uh, for instance, C, C clutter and, the, and they weren't able to have sophisticated signal processing techniques which would drive the C clutter down into the noise, so their background was uh, a logarithmically fluctuating background of noise. So the square law versus the linear detector, that really boils down when you look at the calculations. Uh, square law detectors, the, the difference is only about 0.2 dB, and since most of the signal, just about all signal processing today is done in a linear fashion uh, with the voltage, linear detection is used most of the time, but I put in a a, d a dashed arrow here. Then comes the issue uh, as is the data, the multiple pulses, are they fully correlated, partially correlated, or uncorrelated? They're independent one from another. They're fully correlated one as in a steady target. All the pulses are correlated. And, and they can fluctuate from pulse to pulse or from scan to scan, depending upon the physical actions that are going on with the target. For instance, you can uh, naturally, if, if you were looking at a, at a target which was relatively simple, and you were looking at the target broadside, it wouldn't matter whether you sent out a, a, a pulse quickly and then waited for the radar to rotate 360 degrees and hit it again, the, prob the target would probably still have and that, that aspect angle and would have a very highly correlated return, uh, the, tar the target, excuse me, would be highly correlated. Uh, there are partially correlated and quite correlated backgrounds that, that we can deal with, and they are rain, for example. Um, if you don't have a, a, a Doppler processing technique and you try to do detection, in rain, which is correlated, you don't get the full value amount of the non-coherent integration that you'd get if you uh, were dealing with uncorrelated pulses.
And then we have these four different classes of swirling, fluctuating targets. We'll go into what they are, and they have to do with the, the distribution of the fluctuation of the target, its voltage or power, it, and they also have to do with whether the fluctuations are from pulse to pulse or from scan to scan. And then, as these arrows show, you'd come out and then you have to do, after you've combined the data into one single entity, you have to, with that entity, if you coherently integrated a bunch of pulses, you have to make a decision or use binary integration. So this is the general logic flow and tree, in a very general sense, of the different issues we're going to deal with. So the next issue we're going to deal with is the different kinds of integration, and then we'll deal and spend a good chunk of time dealing with target fluctuations. Now, the, the overall detection methodology in calculating the probability of these curves, these receiver operational curves, so-called rock curves. The probability of the PD versus PFA as a function of signal-to-noise ratio. We want to determine the PDF, the probability density function, uh, at the detector output for a single pulse and a fixed signal-to-noise ratio. Now, if there are case fluctuation cases 1 and 3, the targets are highly correlated from pulse to pulse, and so you can in integrate them and then average over the fluctuations from scan to scan. If, the, if there are pulse to pulse fluctuations, you, can, you average over the signal fluctuations and then integrate over the end pulses and then threshold from T to infinity to get the PDF versus PFA. So this is how the calculations are done to get PD versus PFA as a function of signal-to-noise ratio for end pulses for any kind of fluctuations. And we'll, I'm going to show you when we do target fluctuations that swirling, case 1, 2, 3, and 4, aren't the only ways that targets can fluctuate. Now let's go on to the integration of pulses, how we add them up to get greater signal-to-noise ratio. Now for coherent integration, we add the voltages and then we square them. And phase is preserved when we do that. So here are the pulses coming in. We sum them, we add them up, then we square them, and then we threshold. And this would be a square law detection. And then we declare a target if 1 over n, the number of pulses, summation quantity squared, the sum of 1 through n of the voltage of the voltages squared is greater than some threshold. For non-coherent integration, what we do is we square the pulses first and then take the sum of those squares and then threshold. Now in this case, phase is preserved for coherent integration. The pulse and pu to pulse phase coherence is required in the transmitter, and the signal to noise improvement is 10 times the logarithm to the base 10 of the number of pulses that you're integrating. In this case, we're adding powers, not voltages, and the phase neither preserved nor required. It's easier to implement, but not as efficient. There'll be a, a non coherent integration loss and the detection performance can be improved by integrating more pulses, as you can see. Now let's look at the different gains one gets when one integrates pulses. First, let's look at one pulse. And if we integrate 10 of those pulses, we'll get a gain of 10 dB. So that the signal-to-noise ratio per pulse that's required for 0.8 probability of detection 
is 10 dB less than would be required for one pulse. When we go through the, pre the calculations which I previously noted on the previous view graphs, when we co non-coherently integrate 10 pulses, we lose some of the information, and this is the curve we get. So this would be the non-coherent integ integration gain for most cases, coherent integration is more efficient than non-coherent integration. In this case, we've looked at is for a probability of false alarm of 10 to the minus 6 and for a steady target. This would be the 10 dB gain, and this would be roughly a couple of dB or 1.7 dB or something like that, uh, probably 2 dB of non-coherent integration loss, and this would be the gain you get when you were non-coherently integrating the 10 pulses. Now there are different types of non-coherent integration. Uh, non-coherent integration, which can also be called video integration, as in the previous view graph, we generate a magnitude for each of the n pulses, add the magnitudes, and then threshold. Binary integration does this slightly differently. It separately thresholds each pulse, declares a 1 if it, the signal is greater than a threshold and 0 otherwise, and it counts up the number of threshold crossings where you get a 1. And if this threshold, if the threshold, this sum of threshold crossings, it's simpler to implement than coherent or non-coherent integration. Because you're just applying, does it exceed a threshold each pulse? And you give it a 1. You're not carrying along a long bit number. And then there's a cumulative probability of detection where we look at 1 out of n detections. Do we get at least one threshold crossing out of n pulses? And it's similar to this binary integration which requires that we get m out of n detections. Now here's an example of binary integration. We calculate x squared, the, the power, send it through the threshold, and I is the output of each threshold, either a 1 or a 0. And then we add up the I's. Then we apply a threshold is M greater than small m greater than or equal to capital M. Here are the individual pulse detectors. And here are the second thresholding criteria. The target is present if at least m detections occur at least m, so equal or greater than m detections and n pulses. And here is the form of that summation. So if the probability that we'll get at least m out of m detections, m out of n tries, n pulses, is the sum from the index k going through m to n of capital N factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial times the probability of detection on a single pulse times 1 minus the probability of detection to the n minus k, and here it's to the k power. So you do that number of sums. And for cumulative detection, this goes down to, it collapses to the probability of cumulative detection is 1 minus 1 minus the probability of detection of a single pulse to the nth power. Now this shows you the detection statistics for binary integration when we're detecting four pulses. Four pulses are the group we're detecting. It's a steady, non-fluctuating -tar target. 
with a probability of 10 to the minus 6. And here we have the probability of detecting at the total output with different signal-to-noise ratios per pulse. And we see that 3 out of 4 is the optimum. And 1 out of 4 is the least, it needs the most signal-to-noise ratio per pulse. And 2, to three, and 2 out of 4 and 3 out of 4 cross paths at about this point in probability, at, at about this point, about 9 dB. So how do we know the right optimum M out of N? Well, it turns out the optimum M out of N, you can calculate what it is. And here's on a logarithmic scale of the optimum M versus the number of pulses integrated. And so for each binary integrator, M out of N, there exists an optimum. And it jaggles a little bit for less than 10 pulses, and it's pretty steady. And the optimum M for large numbers, it's approximately 0.9 to the times N to the 0.8 power. And this is with a steady non-fluctuating target with a probability of detection of 0.95 and a pr probability of false alarm of 10 to the minus 6. So the optimum M varies somewhat with the fluctuating target model. The parameters for estimating the optimum M, A, the A and B, uh, here are the, the, the optimum A and the optimum B for these ranges of different fluctuations of targets. And these were developed by Dave Schnidman and our, from Mark Rick Richards' book. Now, the, the, the detection statistics uh, for different types of integration. Here we have coherent integration, non-coherent integration, binary integration, and single pulse integration. So it's, it's still showing that for the non-coherent integration, this is coherent integration of four pulses, you get 6 dB less need in signal-to-noise ratio than you do over here. But, the, but with non-coherent integration, you have different amounts of losses. And this is for a single pulse. These are when you're integrating four pulses. There's, now let's look at what these different losses are. Oh, before we do that, we can just point out that for 0.95, you can see you need 13.7 dB for a single pulse. And for four pulses, you'll get that. You can see this is dB over. And these are less. But the difference between this, which would be the perfect coherent integration, and this, uh, you want to look at, and that's called the coherent integration loss. And here is that signal to noise pro ratio gain on the one hand, or loss plotted in another relative to coherent. They're the same things plotted. In, in different ways. For coherent integration, and remember these are steady targets, 0.95 probability detection, PFA at 10 to the minus 6. We can read off, right here would be the loss you put into your radar equation. You can see that the, the binary integration with N at the, the, the Optimum, the, the N, M you used with is the square root of, uh, of the capital N gives you this loss. The, the binary optimum M is, gives you this loss. And non-coherent integration gives you the least coherent integration loss. But it does give you a loss. If you're integrating 10 pulses, you lose about 2 dB of signal-to-noise ratio. And here, 
So coherent integration yields the greatest gain. Non-coherent integration, uh, you get a small loss, but it may be much easier to implement. And binary integration has a slightly larger loss than regular non-coherent integration, but maybe it's easier to implement and you may want to trade that loss off. It's about a dB difference here all the way up. But the, using the square root of n for your optimum m uh, is significantly lossier. Now, one thing that needs to be pointed out that's very, very important, and it's the effect of pulse-to-pulse -pulse correlation on non-coherent integration gain. And this was first published by Fred Nathanson in his uh, uh, signal processing book that was published back in the 70s, and the re, uh, second edition is out. Non-coherent integration can, can be very inefficient in correlated noise or clutter. Now, uh, uh, one parameter to look at is the, the ratio of the, the, the spread of the clutter divided by the wavelength times the pulse repetition frequency and and that is a measure of the correlation how correlated things are now let's let's look at a uh, at a hundred pulses when when you're independent you're in this region this quantity is very close to one and it means that there's no correlation from pulse to pulse. So if you put in to your integrator 20 pulses and you have no correlation, the equivalent number of independent samples is 20. And then as the pulses get correlated, as this quantity gets smaller, and notice this is on a logarithmic scale, you get less bang for your buck by doing non-coherent integration. Now up here is the correlation coefficient as a function of the time between pulses. And you can see when the correlation coefficient is very small, you're getting independent. And when the correlate, the, they are very well correlated, like right here, you're getting the equivalent of five pulses, not 20. What, the reason I bring this up is one type of clutter, which has, is highly correlated, is rain. And a, a, a lot of different radars in the recent past, and some even now for people that don't understand this, they will use non-coherent integration in, in rain to integrate the, the target up and beat down the noise power. And but that this shows that that won't work. Okay. Uh, next I'd like to go on. Uh, I showed you that there, it's a very complicated expression the, that's needed to calculate um, the signal to noise ratio for S signal pulses, steady targets, non-fluctuating, um, as a function of the number of independent integrated samples or single pulse. And uh, Albert Chaim developed an empirical formula. Now, the reason this kind of an empirical formula is, is excellent to use is if you ha are building a simulation, an analytical tool, to trade off a lot of different cases of radars, and you're going to be feeding into it different signal-to-noise ratios, and you want to get a general trends of what the probability of detection will be for probability of false alarms. You don't want it down to the Nats eye. These are, this is a very good empirical relationship and the error is less than 0.2 dB between these ranges of probability of false alarm and these probabilities of detection. 
assuming the targets to be non-fluctuating. For independently integrated samples, and I remind you, independently, there's no fluctuation. Again, here's a more complicated formula that has this error with these, and that's the signal-to-noise ratio per, per sample that you're integrating, or per pulse. And the, the error is less than 0.2 dB for these ranges of, of pulse integrated, or, or sample it could be called, probability of false alarm and probability of detection. The details of these are described more in the references to the articles in references 1 or 5. Now we're going to go on to fluctuating targets.